we've explored the giants of our solar system. Jupiter. Saturn. Uranus. And Neptune. Now, let's take a journey to our nearest neighbors, the terrestrial worlds. The terrestrial planets all have rocky surfaces, like what we find here on Earth. In fact, the name terrestrial comes from the Latin word terra, meaning Earth or land. These worlds are our nearest neighbors in space. Two of them, Mercury and Venus, are closer to the Sun than the Earth is, and one, Mars, is slightly farther away. The good news is that due to the shorter distances between the inner planets, they are much easier to see with a telescope. So if you don't already have one, you should go and pick one up. Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun. This means it always lies near the Sun in our sky, making it difficult to see during most of the year. During its greatest elongations, however, Mercury is at a maximum angular separation from the Sun from the Earth's perspective. In November, Mercury will reach its greatest western elongation, meaning that it is visible with a telescope above the east horizon for a very brief period of time before the Sun rises. Mercury's surface has a striking resemblance to that of our moon, bearing the scars of impacts that occurred during the heavy bombardment period. The largest of these, Calaris Basin, is approximately 1300 kilometers or 800 miles in diameter. Given its proximity to the sun, when astronomers tried to calculate the position of Mercury using Kepler's laws, they consistently got the wrong answer. This issue was not resolved mathematically until Einstein came along with his theory of relativity. Einstein postulated that space and time must be treated as a single entity called space-time, and that in the presence of matter or energy, space-time bends. In this way, gravity is no longer a traditional force, but rather objects are simply following the shortest paths between two points in a curved space-time. In many situations, the curvature of spacetime is gentle enough that Kepler's laws and Newton's theory of gravity make accurate predictions. But for Mercury, the curvature of spacetime is a bit more extreme given how close it is to the Sun. This causes the perihelion point, the point in its orbit where it is closest to the Sun, to precess or move more than Newton's theory of gravity predicts. The shapes of planetary orbits are ellipses with two focal points. One focal point is the position of the Sun, the source of the attractive force that pulls Mercury around. The second focal point is the main source of error between Kepler's laws and relativity, as it actually orbits the Sun as well, causing the orbit of Mercury to look like a pattern of flower petals when traced over a long period of time. Similar to Mercury, since Venus is also closer to the Sun than the Earth is, it too only appears close to the Sun in our sky. This means that if you hope to catch a glimpse of it, you'll always have to head out either early in the morning before sunrise, or shortly after sunset in the evenings. In November, Venus will rise just a little while before Mercury, about two hours before sunrise.
At first glance, Venus seems to be a rather featureless world. This is for the same reason that, despite being the second closest planet to the sun, Venus is actually the hottest planet, its thick atmosphere. However, the atmosphere here isn't made of oxygen and nitrogen like on the Earth. Instead, it's mostly made of carbon dioxide with clouds of sulfuric acid. These chemicals trap heat between the clouds and the surface, creating what scientists call a greenhouse effect. The surface temperature on Venus averages around 464 degrees Celsius. That's about 867 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to melt lead. If we peel back the layers of clouds that completely shroud the planet, we find a surface with evidence of extensive volcanism, a likely source of the sulfuric acid clouds. Most of the surface consists of smooth, volcanic plains and some wrinkle ridges. The rest of the surface is made up of two highland continents. In the northern hemisphere, we find Ishtar Terra, named after the Babylonian goddess of love. And if we head just south of the equator, we'll find Aphrodite Terra, named after the Greek goddess. Due to the thick layer of clouds, none of this was well known until Venus was visited by spacecrafts from the Earth. The first one, visited in 1970 and was called the USSR Venera 7. It crash landed on the surface and transmitted weak signals until its technology failed about 23 minutes later. Venera 13 landed on Venus 12 years later, in the year 1982, and was able to take the first color photograph of the surface. The detailed maps of the surface weren't made until 1991 when the Magellan Orbiter was able to use radar waves to reveal Venus's topography. Venus also rotates in the opposite direction of its orbit. This is what astronomers call retrograde rotation. It also rotates very slowly. One day on Venus would last about 243 Earth days. This is actually about 18 days longer than it takes for Venus to orbit the Sun. Notice that we haven't mentioned anything about moons around either Venus or Mercury. This is for the simple reason that neither planet actually has any moons. Due to gravitational interactions with our Sun, as a moon would orbit around either of these inner worlds, the Sun would pull so hard on the moon when it's on the nearer side when compared to the further side that it creates an unstable orbit. After thousands of years, this would send a moon flying into the icy depths of space or on a collision path with another body. For Venus specifically, a captured moon that orbits in the opposite direction of Venus's rotation would lose energy due to gravitational decay over time, leading to the moon falling into the surface. Let's head back home. Before we head back to the surface, let's pause here for a moment and appreciate the beauty of our home among the stars. A lot of that beauty arises from the fact that the Earth exists in what astronomers call the liquid habitable zone. This is sometimes called the Goldilocks zone for short, since it's not too hot, not too cold, but just the right temperature for liquid water to exist on the surface. If your planet orbits closer to the parent star than the habitable zone, then any liquid water would boil and become steam. Conversely, if your planet orbits farther from your parent star than its Goldilocks zone, the liquid water would freeze into ice. As we look for other habitable worlds, we generally look inside the habitable zone of stars outside of our solar system. Scientists think that water being in its liquid form is essential to the development of life so we deem it a necessity of a possible second home to humans. In addition to having liquid water, the Earth has an atmosphere that is conducive to life. Although the atmosphere is mostly made up of nitrogen, due to the aerobic processes of animals and the process of photosynthesis in plants, Earth's atmosphere has lots of oxygen and carbon dioxide in it. Additionally, the Earth has a magnetic field that shields us from the ionized particles that travel away from the sun at high velocities. Astronomers call this the solar wind. 
When they are pulled magnetically towards the Earth, they are attracted to the poles. And when these ionized particles reach the atmosphere, they react to form brilliant colors in the sky called auroras. Liquid water, a breathable atmosphere, and a magnetic field are all basic requirements for life to develop safely. Our moon may have even played a role in the development of life here on Earth. The moon is made up of lighter and darker spots called the highlands and the maria. The lighter highlands are the original surface. When the moon was new and molten, the chemical composition was the same throughout, but as it cooled, the heavier elements settled towards the core, where the lighter elements moved towards the surface. These highlands are made of that lighter material. The maria, however, are the product of the immense collisions with asteroids. The resultant craters created tremendous pools with cracks in the bottom that allowed for hot magma containing heavier material to seep through and fill up the crater. This material cooled in the crater and left behind the dark maria. While the moon probably rotated at one point, the maria is actually causing the moon to become rotationally trapped by Earth's gravity. Since the maria is heavier than the highlands, and the maria is not distributed evenly across the surface, there is a side of the moon that is being pulled harder. As a result, the moon's heavier side now faces the Earth constantly, a state known as being tidally locked. Speaking of tides, Scientists believe that the ocean being pulled by the moon produces areas along the shores of prehistoric Earth where water was trapped and warmed by the sun during low tide and then returned to the ocean during high tide. This could have acted as a catalyst for life developing here on Earth. In November, the moon will be passing through the Earth's shadow in space indirectly. Astronomers call this a penumbral lunar eclipse. This is different from a total lunar eclipse when the moon passes through the umbra. The umbra is the darker part of the Earth's shadow, and the penumbra is the lighter part of the Earth's shadow. This event will occur on November 30th, so be sure to take the night off and hope for some clear skies. In November, you can find Mars pretty high in the southern sky around 8pm. It is a world that has frequently inspired the human imagination. When pointing his telescope at Mars during the opposition of 1877, Giovanni Schiaparelli noted seeing canali, the Italian word for channels on Mars. This word was mistranslated into canals which led to the speculation of an intelligent civilization on Mars that had constructed massive canals. Since then, many fiction stories have been written about little green men on Mars. In recent decades, Mars has been the topic of much research and exploration culminating in the discovery of frozen water found on the surface. Mars falls on the edge of the Goldilocks zone for our sun, so liquid water on the surface of Mars would be entirely possible if Mars were exposed to some of the same greenhouse gases that Venus and Earth have in abundance. The problem, however, is that Mars doesn't have a magnetic field, and it's not able to retain much of an atmosphere. Whatever atmosphere that Mars used to have has long since been blasted away by the solar wind.
On Mars, we find the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. Olympus Mons is two and a half times bigger than Earth's largest volcano, Mauna Loa, and covers a surface area larger than Arizona. Another striking feature of the Martian surface is a vast canyon system known as Valles Marineris, which puts the Grand Canyon here on Earth to shame. Valles Marineris is 4,000 kilometers long, 200 kilometers wide, and up to 7 kilometers deep. To put that in perspective, it would stretch across the entirety of the United States all the way from New York City to Los Angeles. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Due to their size and irregular shapes, they are both believed to be captured asteroids. Interestingly, they are moving apart. While Phobos spirals inward on a path to collision with Mars' surface, Deimos inches further and further. Eventually, it will be shot into space. Yet further evidence that the moons of Mars are captured asteroids is that the two orbit in opposite directions, with Phobos quickly marching across the Martian sky in its retrograde orbit. In spite of all that we know about the terrestrial planets, there is still much in the realm of speculation. But with missions currently ongoing or planned for the near future, including a possibly manned mission to Mars, hopefully soon we will get to know our nearest neighbors much better.